morning, everyone. Um, this morning's Bible reading is taken from Acts 4, verse 1 to 22. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of God. Thanks, Linda. Uh, why don't you join me in a word of prayer before we come to God's word. Father, we, we pray that you would give us the power to understand the height and breadth and depth for your love, of your love for us in Christ Jesus that we might be full to overflowing and that we might flow out into others, that we might proclaim the excellencies of our God to a lost and discouraged and defeated and dark world. Please will you work in us by your spirit now, bring us to yourself through your son that we might go out and be his ambassadors in the week that lies ahead. We pray this in his name. Amen. You'll remember that right at the beginning of Acts, Jesus tells his disciples that they will be his witnesses to the very ends of the earth. They are to share the word with the world. Of course, that mandate hasn't changed. It's right at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. It's right at the heart of our DNA as a local church. We are a redeemed family of servants on mission. And that is something we are before it's anything that we do. It's who he's made us. It's been our philosophy of ministry right from the very beginning of this church. Change happens when the word of God is opened in the power of the Spirit. So if you were wondering what's our philosophy of ministry, there it is. And it's from the mandate that Jesus gave to his 
first disciples. Change, hap change happens when the word of God is opened in the power of the Spirit. That is not restricted to preaching. We are talking about any setting in which a believer speaks the word of God and witnesses to the king in the power of the Spirit. That's our calling. We proclaim Christ and him crucified. We do it in a hostile world. I don't need to tell you. The world does not welcome the message of Jesus because light exposes darkness for what it is. The world is hostile to our message. So how do we deliver this message to this world? What can we expect? Our passage this morning gives us wonderful insights. It gives us a window into what sharing the word in a hostile world looks like and what we can expect as we do it. So what do we see? I think there are at least two sobering realities and then three great encouragements from our passage. Two sobering realities, three great encouragements. So let's start with the sober reality. Sharing the word comes with a cost. It also comes with an obligation. There are two sobering realities. Sharing the word comes with a cost and it comes with an obligation. We start with a cost. Acts chapter 4 verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. While Peter and John were sharing the word, the Sadducees came upon them. Now, who were the Sadducees? They were the religious aristocracy of that day. So let's think about them. Let's just build a little profile of their economics, their politics, and their theology. Economically, they were the upper class. Simple. Politically, they were pragmatic. In other words, it wasn't about principle. It was about what worked. And what worked politically in the first century was to align yourself with Rome. Rome was the big boy on the block. You wanted to be on his team. So that's what they did. They supported the Roman occupation of their own people because it worked. Political pragmatists. Theologically, they were materialists. They thought that the Messiah had already come and gone. They rejected the resurrection. They believed that death was the end for everyone. We are dust. We remain dust. Theological materialists. For all of those reasons, they did not like any mention of Jesus. Let's think about it. Jesus was for the people. They were upper class. Jesus claimed to be king. What about Caesar? What's Rome going to think of this? Jesus rose from the dead. Nobody rises from the dead. It's all offensive. It was offensive either to the Sadducees themselves or to their paymasters, Rome. And they would not allow it. They were the establishment. They had the upper hand in temple politics. They were hostile to the word and they had the power. And so the apostles were arrested and imprisoned with no idea how this is all going to play out. Can you imagine what must have been going through their minds that night in prison? I'm sure it must have been incredibly hard for them to suppress thoughts of Jesus' arrest, of his phony trial, of how it all ended in a cruel death for him. Sharing the word came with a cost. It still does. Today, somewhere in the world, 13 of our brothers and sisters will die for their faith. Another 12 will be arrested. Five more will be abducted. 13 churches will be attacked, violently attacked. Today, tomorrow, the day after that. 
There are places in the world where the price you pay for sharing the word is ultimate. We live in a time and place where the cost is minimal, and Lengiwe gave thanks for that this morning, and it's right for us to give thanks that we have freedoms. But that said, I think the cost is rising. What does it look like in our context? We also face an increasingly hostile establishment. We live, of course, in suburban Africa, where there are two mighty rivers of culture that converge. There's this confluence of culture, the Western River and the African River. They come together. And so the hostile establishment in that context has two faces. We'll start with Western pluralism. This is the idea that all, all perspectives have equal validity. There is no truth with a capital T. There is no decisive truth, truth in the end, absolute truth. No, there's just your truth and my truth. The religious version of this is one we all know well. All roads lead to the top of the mountain. Familiar with that? We've heard it as a common view. We've all heard somebody say that. Perhaps we ourselves believed it at one time or another. Perhaps you believe it this morning. In fact, earlier this year I was having a conversation with a farmer uh, a farmer who professed to be Christian, and we were talking about Christian things. Now, bear in mind, farmers tend to be conservative, and yet out he came with it. At some point in the conversation, he said to me, I believe religion, uh, religion is like a mountain. All roads lead to the top of the mountain. What I should have said, it's amazing how brilliant we are as evangelists after the fact. I was amazing in my daydreams. <laughs> what I should have said to him was this. That may be true of religion, but the Christian faith is not religion. And so it tells a different story. There is a mountain, but none of us can climb it. And so God himself has to come down to us in the person of Jesus. So much better than the mouthful of teeth that I had on the day. Anyway, that's Western pluralism. All roads lead to the top of the mountain. Now imagine saying to Western pluralism, verse 12, There is salvation in no one else but Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the one thing you cannot say to Western pluralism. It doesn't go down well. They are very intolerant in their tolerance. There's a family that used to be committed members here at CCM. Um, they were Australian by birth. They've since gone back to Australia. Their oldest son uh, just got, or well, recently, I think in the last year or so, got, a, got his first job as an engineer. He's about to lose that job. Why? He has decided that as a Christian, he cannot call someone by their preferred pronoun. In other words, he said yes to Jesus and no to Western pluralism. And it is going to cost him. Imagine having that dismissal on your CV as you start out as a young person in life. Now that's Australia. Granted, we are not there yet. But our cultural establishment is openly and aggressively and increasingly hostile to the word. The other face, face of the establishment, remember we said it has two faces in our context. The other face is African spiritualism. Now Black tells me that in an effort to reject colonialism and embrace African roots, it has become very fashionable amongst young African celebrities to become a Sangoma. So musicians, YouTubers, actors, influencers, you name it, every time you turn around, there's another big reveal. I've left Gauteng, I'm no longer in Gauteng, I'm now, I've relocated to the Eastern Cape and I've become a Sangoma. And here's a TikTok video to prove it. 
Again, try saying to the cultural establishment of African spiritualism, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else but Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I imagine it is not going to go down well. You will be accused of being a sellout or an imperialist. Forget the fact that Jesus was a brown-skinned man, much closer culturally to African traditional community than anything from the West. Forget the fact that if he ever went to London, he would find the place cold, both physically and socially. <laughs> Forget that. Proclaim Christ and there will be a cost in your family, in your community, in your workplace. Western pluralism, African spiritualism, the two faces of the establishment in our context. Sometimes they come together in strange and amusing ways. So uh, when I was working for government, I went to my boss to tell her that I'm resigning, I'm leaving to go to the ministry. She looked at me with this incredibly puzzled look on her face. There was this awkward silence. And then she smiled and said, that's wonderful. I've got a cousin in the Eastern Cape who's a Sangoma. <laughs> that story's not going to add any value to your life, but there you go. <laughs> the point is that our world is increasingly hostile to the word and sharing the word comes with a cost. It's a sobering reality. There's one more sobering reality that I want us to see from our text. Sharing the word also comes with a clear obligation. Verse 18. So the establishment called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Which is what our establishment says all the time in subtle ways. Verse 19. But, she, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples. You will be my witnesses. It's not an optional extra. It's not tick the box. You will be my witnesses. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a witness of Jesus. They are one and the same. To be in the family is to be on mission. It's who we are before it's anything we do. It's what he's made us. Now, how we do it, so please hear this, how we do it is going to vary from person to person. It depends on your gifting. It depends on your experiences. It depends on what God has called you to in life. But we are all witnesses in our own way. What motivates us? Well, the first motivation is plain. It's straight from our text. We can't miss it. Obedience. God is God. We are his creatures. We are his children. He has told us what to do. So we do it. That's the only appropriate way to respond. Now, of course, we don't always respond like that, but what is appropriate? God speaks. We obey. We also know that God only ever asks us to do what is good for us and for those around us. So obedience is the good life. But it's still simple. God speaks, we obey. That's the first motivation. God in his graciousness gives us a whole range. Let me give you one more through the Apostle Paul. When answering the question, why should we try and persuade others? He answers that. The love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. That's Christ's love for us compels us to share him because we are convinced that one died for all. The more we grasp Jesus' love for us, the more it is going to fill us to overflowing and spill out for others. It's a bit like this when you first fall in love. Can you remember 
For some of us, it's a, it's a far reach back into the archives. When you first fall in love, you want to tell everyone. Okay, now for those of you who have just fallen in love, let me be frank. We do not want to hear it. Okay? <laughs> we would rather pass a kidney stone than hear, hear you tell us again just how, much, how amazing this is. How, but you're going to tell us anyway, so let's face facts. You're going to tell us anyway. You're going to tell us how amazing this person is. And what's so amazing is that they think you're amazing. How much more so the love of God? The love of God is not the puppy love of a teenage rom-com. God knows everything about you. Everything. Every failure. Every embarrassment. Every shameful moment. And he loves you anyway. More than that. He loved you when you still hated him. When you were part of the establishment, he loved you. And his love is not just sentiment, chocolates and roses. His love is pain and suffering and the most humiliating death imaginable. The more we see that, the more we want, we're going to want to share it with others. The more it's going to fill us to overflowing and we're going to want to share it with others. With anyone who will listen. God's love for us compels us to love others enough to share with them this great news. So sharing the word comes with a clear obligation. It's an obligation to God himself. We are compelled by simple obedience. We are compelled by his love for us to share the word. We have an obligation to share no matter the cost. Judge for yourself, Peter says, whether we should listen to the establishment or listen to God. Two sobering realities. Sharing comes with a cost that comes with a clear obligation. I know it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like a burden. Thanks be to God, we also have three great encouragements from him in our passage. So sharing the word may come with a costly obligation, but it also comes with divine power, with supporting evidence, and with an eternal reward. Divine power, supporting evidence, and an eternal reward. Let's start with the power. Verse 5. After the apostles were arrested, we read this. So they arrested then, verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers, elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done for a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by men by which we must be saved. All the religious figures in Jerusalem gather together. It's a council of 71. They sit in a semicircle. In the center of that semicircle is the patriarch of the high priestly family, the high priest himself, Annas and Caiaphas, the men who presided over the trial of Jesus. Peter and John and the cripple are brought before them, before this entire machine. Can you imagine how intimidating that must have been? 
You can almost feel the power imbalance when you read the account. The most powerful men in the city on one side, two working class preachers and a cripple on the other side. And the previous meeting like this ended in a horrible death for the underdog. The council's question, who gave you the authority to do this? Because it wasn't us. So who was it? You need to answer for yourself. How dare you? If it wasn't us, who was it? As if to answer the question at that very point, the Holy Spirit enters into Peter. The Spirit of Christ comes close to him to once again give him the power. The power for what? The power to share the word. And notice how powerfully he speaks. The whole trial is turned on its head. The council itself is now on trial. Listen to the intensity and the accusation in Peter's words. If we are on trial for doing good, can you hear the accusation? Then you need to know who did the good. It was Jesus, the one you killed, but God raised from the dead. The one you rejected, can you hear the accusation? But God vindicated. Jesus healed this man. Jesus is his name. And there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved, by which you can be saved. You feel the power in those words? They are fierce in exposing the guilt, but somehow still merciful in offering the only way out. The power that filled Peter when he healed the cripple is the same power that fills him to speak God's word. It is the power of God's spirit, the spirit of Christ. Peter was not left to face that tribunal alone. The power of God Almighty entered into him so that he could share the word. Spirit and word always go together in Acts. It's why at Pentecost, the rushing wind, the spirit, was accompanied by tongues, think speech, tongues of fire, the empowered word, spirit and word. The two go together. They always go together throughout Acts. And they go together in our lives today. When you are called to speak, God will give you the power. However fierce the opposition may be, Peter stood before a council of 71 of the most powerful men in his city. They had crucified his master. But his master did not abandon him. And your master will not abandon you. When the time comes, he will empower us to speak. Sharing the word not only comes with this divine power, it also comes with supporting evidence. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. The council are astonished at the power of what Peter is saying. These are ordinary working class men. Where did they get the power? They shouldn't be able to speak with such power and such wisdom. But then they, then they remembered that they had been with Jesus. And that would explain it. They wanted to dismiss this word, but they had a real problem. A man born lame was standing in that very council before them. He had been healed. He was living evidence that God can heal those who are spiritual cripples, sinful from birth. They simply had no answer to the evidence. You and I also have evidence at our disposal. 
We are just ordinary people. But we can speak the word of God with boldness. How? Because we too have been with Jesus. We have lived with him. We have walked with him. His spirit fills us. And secondly, you can also point to a healing of your own. You have been saved by Jesus. You are living evidence that no one can refute. No one can argue with the fact that you have been saved by Jesus. It's clear for anyone with eyes to see, for anyone with ears to hear. Anyone who has known you will know something is different. No one can argue because it's true. There's another reason no one can argue. One of the perks of Western pluralism is that no one can argue because it's against the rules. Your reality is true. Those are the rules. You do you. No one can argue. I know of a Christian teenager at a big secular school who was asked to give a four-minute talk on her identity. Now that is cruel and unusual punishment in itself. When I was at school, it was 30 seconds on your hobbies. <laughs> I like fishing, you know. Four minutes on your identity as a teenager. Anyway, she gave the talk and she went all in, all boots in. She proclaimed in no uncertain terms that the center of her identity is Christ. And here's the staggering thing. Even though the English teacher scowled, she couldn't criticize. She couldn't dismiss. It's against the rules. Everyone has a right to their truth. Christians, let's exercise that right. Let's be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. There's a loophole. Let's exploit it. Let's just point to the evidence. Jesus has changed my life. No one can argue with that. Let's tell people about it. Now, of course, we do have to face facts, and we do have to bear in mind that not everyone will listen. Even if they can't deny the evidence, it doesn't mean they're going to accept Christ. Look at verse 15 again. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further amongst the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. How hard-hearted are these men? How hard-hearted are we as sinners? They couldn't deny. They couldn't deny. By their own admission, they could not deny that a notable sign had been done. The evidence was there, and it could not be denied. Instead of doing what any sane, rational person would do and follow the trail of the evidence, they decide to bury the sign. The sign says this way to Durban. But we refuse to believe in Durban. There's only Josie. There's no other city. There is no Durban. So we are not going to follow the sign. No, we're going to cover the sign with a blanket instead. Sin is not rational. Sin is a kind of madness. Paul was right when he said that in our sin we suppress the truth. So even if you share the evidence of your own changed life, which no one can refute you are still likely to encounter hard-hearted rejection. But don't be discouraged. Because sharing the word not only comes with divine power and supporting evidence, it also comes with an eternal reward. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Acts chapter 4 verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. You and I are not apostles. We are unlikely to see 5,000 people come to faith when we share the word. We may not even see one person come to faith when we share the word. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. The Lord himself has promised that his word will never return empty. When you share the word, it always serves the Lord's purposes. Often in unseen ways, often in ways we are not going to see this side of heaven. Let me close with this story. There was a young boy called Richard. And uh, when he was six years old, he went to a mission outreach on a beach. And the leaders of the mission outreach shared the gospel, and then they invited the kids to respond by writing a letter to Jesus. Richard thankfully declined and went home. But he did think about it. And after he had done his thinking, he went to his mother to ask her how he could know Jesus, how Jesus could become his friend. So she prayed with him. And he became a follower of Jesus. Today, he's a pastor who has planted over 30 churches. He shares the word of God in one of the most gospel-hating environments in the world, the city of London. And even though he shares in such a hostile context, hundreds of people have come to faith under his ministry. I know four pastors leading thriving churches in and around this city alone that came to faith under his ministry. Question, do the people who shared the word with him on some obscure, windswept English beach deep in the 1970s, do they even have a vague recollection of a little boy called Richard? The answer is almost certainly not, none whatsoever. But under the blessing of God, their efforts to share the word will have an eternal reward. And under the same blessing of God, yours will too. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the musicians to come up. We're going to respond in song. While they're coming up, let's pray. Father, we confess that each and every one of us should long to be better ministers of your word. And in our better moments, we do long for it, Lord. Help us to see our obligation, to see how your love for us compels us. Help us to face the cost of sharing when it comes, when it inevitably comes. Give us the power of your spirit to share boldly. Remind us of all the evidence of your saving goodness in our lives. And help us to look forward to that eternal reward that awaits for us in your presence, in glory. The people we've shared with, they will be our joy and our crown. Father, help us by the presence and power of your Spirit to be ambassadors for your Son wherever you've placed us. In his name we pray. Amen.